Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to another exciting iceberg video. I hope you're ready to open this pit up because it's Metalocalypse time, baby. Metalocalypse was an Adult Swim original animated series that ran from 2006 to 2013 and focused on the metal band Death Clock and their overwhelmingly successful career. That's at least the basic spark notes of the series for those of you who are not fully aware of the plot of the show, but if you've seen the show before, you're a fan of the series, then you know exactly how deep and wild it gets. In honor of Adult Swim greenlighting a final Metalocalypse movie, which last I checked is still in the works, I figured it would be fun to kick back, relax, put on some extremely tight leather pants that cut off all circulation in my legs, and put together a little iceberg for all of you, and by little, I mean big. So please, if you enjoy this video and you want to see more content from me in the future, leave a like. If you dislike the video, then dislike it, and comment below what your favorite episode of Metalocalypse is, or maybe some unknown trivia that you believe should have been included in this video. Without further ado, grab your knives, ropes, daggers, chains, rocks, laser beams, acid, body bags, and get ready for the breakdown of the century. Let's get started. Death Clock. Let's take this first layer to talk about some things that everyone who has seen this TV show knows about, starting off with the band themselves, Death Clock. Both the animated and real-life band were created by Brendan Small and Tommy Blancha. When it comes to the real-life Death Clock, the band consists of current members Brendan Small, Pete Griffin, Neely Brosh, and Gene Hoglan. The band has put out Death Album and The Trail of the Dead EP in 2007, Death Album 2 in 2009, Death Album 3 in 2012, and the Doomstar Requiem soundtrack in 2013. The band recently got back together last month for this year's Adult Swim Festival block party, which was pretty neat. But in terms of the fictional band, I'll keep it brief since everyone who has seen the show knows about this, but the band was founded by Nathan, Pickles, Squizgar, Murderface, and Magnus. They hired Charles Oftenson as their manager, signed a label contract to Crystal Mountain Records, Records. Magnus became a prick so the band kicked him out. They hosted auditions for a new rhythm guitarist despite Squizgar's wishes. But Toki showed up, they played, Squizgar admitted that he had never met anyone that made him play so well before, and eventually invited Toki to join the band. Death Clock would go on to become the most successful metal band of all time. Those are the basic spark notes. We've seen the show, we know what goes on. Original show name. Everyone knows the name Metalocalypse, but did you know that the original title of the TV show was going to be called Death Clock, spelled like this? The only reason why the show was not named Death Clock was because of an existing trademark. The show and the main characters were renamed to Death Clock with this spelling. The title of the show was then extended to Death Clock Metalocalypse, but obviously the name would have been way too long, so they shortened the title to just Metalocalypse and kept the band name as Death Clock, which was probably a great decision at the end of the day. Former members. Death Clock wasn't always Nathan, Squizgar, Toki, Murderface, and Pickles. Oh, no, 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 no. Long before Toki took his place in the band, there was a man named Magnus Hammersmith, but he was ultimately kicked out of the band for being a complete douche nozzle. He then met his demise in the Doomstar Requiem. And if you want to be technical, Pickles did get replaced in the episode Rehab Clock by a self aware drum machine robot named X2P1158. Guest Stars Throughout the Metalocalypse series, there have been tons of guest stars from the metal and rock scene like Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters, James Hetfield, and Kirk Hammett from Metallica, Slash, Exodus, George Fisher from Cannibal Corpse, Jack Black, Assassino, and more. The Doomstar Requiem The Doomstar Requiem, a clock opera, is the Metalocalypse rock opera special that aired on Adult Swim in late 2013. The story picks up directly where the season 4 finale ended. Toki and Abigail are held captive by the masked metal assassin and Magnus, and it's up to Nathan, Pickles, Squizgar, and Murderface to rescue them. The Prophecy The Prophecy is a series of sacred texts and cave paintings detailing the true nature, power, and destiny of the band Death Clock. It's the basis of the belief system followed by the Church of the Black Clock. It's also a frequent topic of discussion amongst the members of the Tribunal. The prophecy is the Metalocalypse, or to keep it simple, the Apocalypse of Metal. The prophecy was foretold thousands of years ago that five individuals would come together and stop the forces of evil. Nathan, Pickles, Toki, Squizgar, and Murderface are the chosen ones, a force that the fate of the universe hinges upon, or, in Leitman's terms, their gods. The band are not made aware of any of this information until the episode The Church of the Black Clock, when Ishnifis, the High Holy Priest of the Church of the Black Clock, explains the situation to them. The Metalocalypse officially set itself into motion 
abortion once Celestia murdered Cardinal Ravenwood, the religious figure in the episode The Metalocalypse Has Begun. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more about the prophecy in the upcoming Metalocalypse movie, which yes, we are going to talk about later in this video, so don't worry. Like I said at the beginning of this layer, all of these first few entries are just simple common pieces of trivia, nothing crazy. And this was just a basic spark notes of the prophecy, by the way. Like, it gets really in-depth. There's tons of theories from fans about what it all means. If you haven't seen the show, just go watch it. I mean, it's great. And you'll learn a lot more from watching the series than you will from me. But now that we've covered the simple stuff, it's time to dive into the crazy fun stuff. So, without further ado, that, my friends, was the first layer of the iceberg. Murder Face is Gay So there's a strong possibility that Murder Face is gay, or at the very least, he's bisexual. I think about 90% of us could agree that he definitely has some form of interest in men. I mean, the evidence to suggest that Murder Face has an interest in men is definitely present throughout Metalocalypse. There was a post made by a deleted user on the Metalocalypse subreddit which says the following. I have a theory that William Murderface was written to be someone who is a repressed homosexual and that he hates himself for it. I also think that in the finale of Metalocalypse, he would have finally come to terms with it. Think about it. Murderface is filled with self-hatred, can't get a woman to sleep with him even though he is in the biggest band in history, even though he's the bass player. That's no excuse when you're in a band that is the Beatles times 100. He refuses to eat anything shaped like a dick, but in the same episode is found licking a hot dog. He has paraded around naked in front of his other bandmates even though it makes them feel uncomfortable, almost as if he's trying to come out. There was one episode where the Death Clock Doctor jerked him off, which led him to have terrifying visions about being gay. And he attacked Toki while they were recording Inside the Ocean in Season 4 after yelling, At this point I'll take anything! I think it was actually a pretty significant part of his character. And Brendan Small mentioned how they had been setting up things from the very beginning. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I basically agree with this entire thing. I could recall other moments where Murderface was providing us viewers with subtle hints that he finds guys attractive, but I'm very much still under the impression that he's bisexual. Because in that exact same episode where he does get fondled by the Death Clock Doctor, he's thinking about girls while getting fondled. I don't know, you guys can let me know in the comments below what you think. Nathan is Native American. So yeah, Nathan Explosion is white and Native American. Don't believe me? Fine, I get it. You don't trust me. You know, I feel like we're drifting apart anyway. I, I am so sorry. I'm just, I'm working through some emotional issues. But yes, Nathan Explosion is white and Native American. For starters, on his dating profile, he has his ethnicity listed as white and Native American. And sometimes throughout the show, people will refer to Nathan as Tonto, which is a fictional character created by George W. Trendle and Fran Stryker. Tonto is the Native American companion of the Lone Ranger, and usually whenever someone refers to Nathan as Tonto, they get the complete shit kicked out of them. Except this fucking punk. Also, in a Revolver Magazine interview with Nathan Explosion, which we are going to cover in a later entry, the interviewer asked how Native American culture influenced him, and Nathan replied with, I'm not really sure. I mean, I enjoy gambling and cigars. Is that what you mean? I also have very vivid dreams like Native Americans do when they dream walk, but I think that's because I eat ice cream and pepperoni before I go to bed. Ugh. People call me Tonto sometimes. Is this what you're looking for answer-wise? I'm also an 84th Yanimego Indian. They were, uh, cannibals. So yeah, that's dormant within me somewhere. And also in the season 2 episode Death Coraldo, we learn that Nathan's grandmother had an affair when she visited the Amazon. Cancellation after the Doomstar Requiem, Brendan Small attempted to get a final miniseries for Metalocalypse started, but Adult Swim turned down the idea. Brendan then took to Twitter to announce that the network did not want to continue the Metalocalypse series. Despite the network ending the series, Metalocalypse fans took it upon themselves to look for alternative options. Since the entire Metalocalypse series was on Hulu Plus at the time, it became a desired location for fans to focus their campaigning efforts. Fans were quick to contact Hulu, sending tweets and emails, Brendan Small then announced Metalocalypse Now, which was a movement to encourage Adult Swim and Hulu to come together to co-finance a finale to Metalocalypse, which would have been called Metalocalypse, the Army of the Doomstar, the final chapter. There were three ways fans could take part in this campaign. Number one, tweet Hulu and Adult Swim asking them to fund the project. Number two, sign the change.org petition, which we're going to talk about after this. And number three, to mail in guitar picks and a letter to the head of content team 
at Hulu HQ. However, even after crowdfunding $2 million for the project and gathering fans all over the world to convince the network to give the show a proper finale, Adult Swim still said no. According to Brendan, Adult Swim was just not interested in making any more Metalocalypse episodes. It wasn't just a funding issue anymore, it was just a lack of interest. Brendan feels like some fans of the show might have drove the network insane during the Metalocalypse Now campaign and they just took it personally. Rumors and speculation online suggest that Brendan and Mike Lazo or some Adult Swim execs just did not get along super well and that might have been what ultimately put the bullet in the turtle's hooves. <laughs> Wait a minute, what the fuck did I just say? <laughs> Luckily, Adult Swim did make the announcement that three new movies based on Adventure Bros, Aqua Teen, and Metalocalypse were in development, so maybe Mike Lazo and Brendan did have some beef going on at that moment in time, or maybe Metalocalypse was another show that Mike Lazo was just ready to let go. If you guys remember back in 2015, when Aqua Teen was cancelled, Mike Lazo stated that the motive behind the show ending was that he was just ready to move on. Either way, it doesn't really matter now. Maybe the current Adult Swim executives understand the value that the those shows hold and want to keep them going in some way, shape, or form. I mean, that's gotta be the case considering that we're getting Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm in November, the new movie. That's why we're getting a Venture Bros movie at some point. And that's gotta be why the network is letting Brendan finish his baby too. Now, unless Warner Bros. Discovery decides to fuck Brendan Small and Jackson public, I think we should be hearing about the Venture Bros. and Metalocalypse movies very, very soon. My guess is sometime early next year, maybe sooner though, like right after Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm launches. But we'll just have to wait and see. Metalocalypse Petition I did touch upon this entry in my Adult Swim Iceberg video, make sure to check that out after this, and I did briefly mention this petition in the last entry, but Adult Swim reacted to the Metalocalypse Now movement in a very hurtful yet hilarious way. Like I mentioned previously, Adult Swim negotiations to get a final Metalocalypse series fell through, so fans of the show and Brendan started a movement asking Hulu and Adult Swim to co-finance the project. Fans were also encouraged to send guitar picks to Hulu, tweet the networks, and persuade them to give Brendan the chance to finish the series. And well, Adult Swim, known for being the network kings of pranks and trolls, took notice of this movement and struck back hard. The network live streamed their own fax machine and basically made a deal with fans. If they received 25 forms that consisted of at least 125 words on why the show Metalocalypse should be brought back, and fax them over to the network's office, they would sign the metalocalypsechange.org petition to bring back the series. However, Adult Swim's endorsement of this petition in no way whatsoever brought back Metalocalypse, and it was never guaranteed in the first place. So during that live stream, hundreds of petitions flooded the fax machine, but they were all faxed straight into the garbage can. Fans then started to fax other pictures like Nicolas Cage and even porn out of frustration, anger, and uh, well, well, I guess it, because it was funny at the time, too. But yeah, the network never really planned on bringing the show back, despite the outcry from fans. They took part in this campaign to essentially make fun of everyone attempting to bring the show back. I don't think this matters, but I'm gonna say it anyway. The Metalocalypse campaign was sponsored by Rocksmith, Razor, IWD Publishing, Metal Injection, Metal Sucks, Adrenaline PR, Metal Blade Records, Outer Loop Management, and D-Dub Designs. So a lot of metal media magazines, Razor the computer brand, Rocksmith, the game, etc. were all behind the idea of Metalocalypse returning for one final special. Of course, this movement was also endorsed by Kirk Hammett of Metallica and other personalities who have been a part of the show, but I guess that wasn't even enough to bring the show back. But it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, wait till the next entry, we're gonna talk about something exciting. Metalocalypse Movie so three Adult Swim original movies have been known about for a while, so whatever. Spoiler alert, Brendan is finally getting the chance to finish up the Metalocalypse saga. Thank God. Back in 2021, it was announced that three movies based on Aqua Teen Venture Bros and Metalocalypse were in the works and would be straight to DVD, and then they would premiere on Adult Swim and HBO Max about six months later. You know, unless Warner Bros. Discovery decides to shit in a network's bed and take them to court. The Aqua Teen movie has been announced, thank god. It was actually announced back in August, it's called Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm, and it looks fantastic. However, I haven't heard much on the Venture Bros project yet, but according to Brendan Small on Twitter, the Metalocalypse movie is, in fact, in the works. My guess is that it's probably going to be called Metalocalypse The Army of the Doomstar, like the finale miniseries was planned to be called. But Brendan had years to formulate some new ideas for this finale, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens, but... 
unless Warner Bros. Discovery decides to start touching everything Adult Swim related, you know, getting their dirty little hands on all the animation studios, we should be seeing the finale to Metalocalypse either late this year or early next year. That's just my educated guess though. Actually, wait, I lied. I do have a rough idea of when the Metalocalypse movie is going to release. Death Clock recently played at the Adult Swim Festival in Philly back in August, and during the festival, it was confirmed that the next chapter in the series would release in 2023. So hopefully none of us die in the next like four months. Fictional albums. So in the real world, we know that Death Clock has released Death Albums 1, 2, and 3, the Trail of the Dead EP, and the Doomstar Requiem soundtrack. And if you want to be technical, Galacticon 2 Become the Storm. But we'll talk about that later in the video, so don't worry. But anyways, those are all of the known albums, but in the Metalocalypse series, we get to see three fictional albums. Death Water only exists in the show, although some of its songs are included in Death Albums 1 and 2. An unnamed album featuring the band members shirtless and edited to give all of them a ripped physique exists, and Seething Vortex, the album that is destroyed by Nathan in Season 4. And if you take a look at the back of the album, you could see the 17 song track list, which uh, don't ask me to pronounce any of these names because I have no freaking idea unreleased songs. So there's actually quite a few tracks that were featured on Metalocalypse that were never officially released by Death Clock, like Banana Stickers, Sewn Back Together Wrong, I Am's A God, I Think The Death Wedding Song Wasn't Officially Released, Was Crush My Battle Opponent's Balls Released? I don't think so. Uh, there was a throwaway gag where Pickles and Nathan discussed a song called Guts Punch Balls Throw Up, which, <laughs> judging by the title, sounds pretty metal to me. I think the Snakes and Barrels cover of Kill You never officially released. I think. I don't know, there's plenty of songs that were either shown on the show or were just throwaway gags that I wish had official releases. Like, why can't we hear what Guts Punch Balls Throw Up actually sounds like, Brendan? But come on, man. Remember Guts Punch Balls Throw Up? Yeah. Remember that? We go dick -a -dick -a -dick -a -dick -a but that, my friends, was the second layer of the iceberg. Metalocalypse Death Game Metalocalypse Death Game was a cancelled video game based on the TV series. The game would have been set in Mordhaus, where players would have played as a clocketeer, and one of the objectives would have been to fight crazy mutant fans. The game would have also included music from Death Clock, would have been published by Konami, and would have been available on the PS3 and Xbox 360. Ultimately, Death Game was cancelled because the creative direction of the game apparently would have not lived up to the high standards set for the project, which is kind of sad because looking back on all of the gameplay that was shown to us, this game, well at least back in the days of the PS3 and 360, looked fantastic. It's kind of sad that we'll never get the chance to play this game unless for some strange unknown reason reason the IP gets revived or whatever. If you do want to check out some more footage of this cancelled game, then search up Metalocalypse Death Game on YouTube and you should be able to find some videos on it. Guitar Hero Rocksmith Brutal Legend Features Remember that time that Death Clock music was featured in the Guitar Hero franchise? No? Well you might want to sit down for this one, Dad. Thunder Horse was a bonus track featured in Guitar Hero 2, Laser Cannon Death Sentence was a downloadable song for Guitar Hero 5, and Bloodlines was on the main set list for Guitar Hero Warriors of Rock, which is pretty dope. And while we're on the topic of Death Clock and video games, I only know this because I play Rocksmith religiously, but in Rocksmith 2014, there is a Death Clock pack featuring Thunder Horse, Awaken, and Go Into the Water. And if you're on PC and you know how to install custom songs to your Rocksmith game using Custom Forge, then there's probably dozens of other classic Death Clock songs for you to learn as well. So if you own Rocksmith and you want to learn or jam to some Death Clock, definitely check out that pack. And I figured I'd mention this as well, but Mermaider was featured in the game Brutal Legend, if you guys have ever played that game as well. There was even a promo that was created to advertise the game starring Death Clock and Eddie Riggs from the game. I sadly can't get away with playing this clip. I mean, maybe I can. Okay, how about a snippet? If you need anything else, stop talking to me or I'll fire you. I'll be over there. There you go. Are you satisfied enough? Look, just search up Eddie Riggs Roadies for Death Clock, Extended and Uncut, and you'll find it on YouTube. I can't play it because, you know, copyright. Metalocalypse Comic Books Not only has Metalocalypse branched into the video game scene, but the show has also invaded the comic book world. 
Back in July of 09, Dark Horse Comics released Death Clock vs. The Goon, a non-canon story in the Metalocalypse universe. A year later, in 2010 and early 2011, Dark Horse Comics released a miniseries of Metalocalypse comics titled Death Clock 1, 2, and 3. And then halfway through 2011, Dark Horse put out Death Clock HC, or Death Clock Hardcover, which was a hardcover edition of all of the previously released Death Clock comics, including Death Clock vs. The Goon. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the hardcover edition on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. In fact, the only place I could find any of these comics at the time of me writing this script was eBay. And trust me, I have seen prices from $75 to $150 for these hardcover editions. I know, it's pretty crazy. If you're interested in buying a comic for yourself, then be warned. Your wallet is going to feel incredible amounts of pain and discomfort like no other. Unless, of course, you're in the top 1% of society, then money shouldn't be an issue to you. <laughs> I'm just going to go over in this corner and count my coins. Guitar Tablature Books in case you're feeling frisky, your old classic, and you don't want to learn Death Clock songs using Rocksmith 2014, then don't worry, I got you covered, baby. I'm sorry, I'm never going to call you that again. There are a few Death Clock guitar tablature books in existence. I believe there is a tablature book for each Death album, so three tab books all together. I've seen some used tab books on Amazon for $55, and I've also seen some for over $700. Yeah, I know, it's kind of ridiculous, but I don't believe these books are printed anymore, so it kind of makes sense why they go for such a high price online. Like I said before, if you have the assets and you love anything and everything Metalocalypse and Death Clock related, and you need these books, books for your collection more than a fish needs water to breathe, they're out there online for you to buy. Again, I'm just gonna sit over in this corner and just count my loose change. Death Tolls 1 and 2 In 2009, the UK Adult Swim site released two Flash games titled Metalocalypse Death Toll and Death Toll 2. The games are played in a similar way to Guitar Hero or Rock Band, except of course with Death Clock songs. Basically, you click the A, S, D, and F keys whenever you have to play a note. I did check archive.org to see if someone saved these Flash games, but unfortunately, I don't think anyone saved them. Unless one of you guys knows a website where these games are playable, please keep me posted in the comments about that. Death Clock, Fact or Fiction? So Loudwire is a rock and media metal magazine. They talk about new music from popular bands in the scene, and they have a series on their YouTube channel called Wikipedia Fact or Fiction, where they invite members of bands and solo artists to discuss what exactly on their Wikipedia page is fact or fiction. Most of the time the information is accurate, but sometimes artists will have to clarify or correct some information that is presented on their wiki page. And it's pretty interesting to watch if you are curious to learn more about your favorite bands and artists. Like they've had Rob Zombie on, Richard from Rammstein, I believe Amy Lee was on an episode of 1.2. While in one special episode of Wikipedia Fact or Fiction, Grant Hartman sat down for a call with none other the Nathan Explosion, Squizgar Squizgulf, and Pickles. Yes, members of Death Clock were on an episode of Wikipedia Fact or Fiction back in 2016. So technically, it was Brandon Small doing the voices on a call, but it was still really cool. Definitely give it a watch if you want to learn more about Death Clock, what's true and false about their Wikipedia page, or if you just want a good laugh, because it is pretty hilarious. Nathan Explosion Revolver Interview Similar to Death Clock Fact or Fiction, we have yet another instance of Death Clock being interviewed by a real rock magazine. This time around, it's Revolver. Revolver sat down with Nathan Explosion back in November of 2012 to discuss topics like his early days, to Death Clock, to... You know what, why don't I just read some of this interview for you? What do you remember about being born? Nothing. I remember nothing now that I think of it. Now I'm starting to wonder if it even happened. Fuck! I may have not been born. That's weird. I never thought of this before. I might be the only living person that wasn't even born. Fuck. How did you spend your first million? Bud Light, next question. You were once governor of Florida. What was the hardest part of being in charge? Waking up early for meetings. That's probably the only reason I wouldn't be president. That dude's gotta wake up early, and I'd rather die than wake up before 2 p.m. I'm fucking serious about that. Fucking wake up. Fuck that shit. Looking back on your life so far, what are you proudest of? Shit, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, shit, I, I mean, I guess I'm proud of nothing. I'm not very proud of anything. I'm not proud of the success or the money or anything. I'm vaguely proud of the amount of sex I've had. But I mean, the idea of looking back on my life seems like something Oprah would do to try to get you to be vulnerable. So I'm gonna go the other way and say, you, I'm not proud, I'm angry. Thank you for trying to make me vulnerable. 
When did you start learning French? Has it ever gotten you in trouble while on tour in Canada, France, or Africa? I got lost and missed the bus in Montreal once while on tour. And this nice group of beautiful young strippers took me in and took care of me for a few weeks. In exchange for pleasuring them sexually, they would teach me remedial French. A pretty good deal, anyway you slice it. Now I know enough French to order a burger and get a lap dance. Okay, that's enough of that. Soundgarden's Black Rain music video. How many of you out there know who Soundgarden are? Raise your hands. Alright, good. I hope all of you do, because they're one of the greatest rock bands of all time. Rest in peace, Chris Cornell. Anyways, back in 2010, Soundgarden released a music video for their song, Black Rain. Now I know what some of you are probably thinking. What does this have to do with Metalocalypse? Why do you always blue ball us, you bald bastard? Well, well hold on, Melissa. Alright, I'm getting to the point. God damn. If you take a look at the Black Rain music video, you might notice some familiar faces. Yeah. Death Clock are featured in this music video. In fact, the animation style is very similar to Metalocalypse the show. But how is this possible? How is this possible, Jonathan? How do you know? Well, the music video was directed by the one and only Brendan Small. Great song and an awesome video. Definitely give it a watch. King of the Hill crossover. So in the Metalocalypse episode Deathmas, we see Murderface and Nubbler host their Christmas special, which is funded by the Christian Church. And during the commercial break of the Christmas special, we see two familiar looking characters appear on screen. It's an ad by the Christian Church and it features, wait for it, Hank and Bobby Hill. Now, obviously, they don't look 100% like their King of the Hill character designs, but these two are indeed Hank and Bobby Hill. And if you don't believe me, listen to their voices. I wasn't picked for the team. That's alright, son. God loves you. I remember first seeing this episode and just laughing my tits off because it was just so unexpected. And as a kid, I used to just laugh at everything, but that's besides the point. Plus, Hank and Bobby Hill voice impressions is like a very popular inside joke amongst my group of friends. Like, sometimes we'll randomly just start speaking with a Hank or Bobby Hill voice. Hey, Dad! Whoa! I don't know, it's just really hilarious. So whenever I hear those two voices, I just cannot contain my laughter. Mentioned in other Adult Swim shows. Believe it or not, Metalocalypse has sort of made some crossover appearances in other Adult Swim properties. For example, in China, Illinois Season 3 Episode 1, there is a character with dreadlocks named Cinnamon, which kind of resembles Pickles during his Snakes and Barrel days. The name pun is also a dead giveaway that this is a reference to Pickles for Metalocalypse because both characters are named after food and don't have a last name. And I also believe the name Cinnamon could be a reference to when Pickles stated that he tried to buy a Cinnamon Bun franchise. I tried to buy that Cinnamon Bun franchise thing, but... Uh, oh yeah, what the hell? Too drunk. And you know what's funny? I guess a lot of people love Pickles because he also makes an appearance in the Rick and Morty comics, specifically issue number five. There's probably other Adult Swim references, but these are the only two I could find. And the only reason I know about these two little nods to Metalocalypse was from a YouTube channel named Minty Shit. Great name, by the way. They did a whole video on Metalocalypse facts, so if you want to check that out, give it a watch. But that, my friends, was the third layer of the iceberg. The Death Theme Lyrics Debate so there's a debate going on about what the lyrics for the Metalocalypse opening song are. You know, that little ditty that Brendan Small growls? You know, the part that's like, do, 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 do. Well, people online are questioning whether that line is do anything for Death Clock or doodly ding dong tick tock. And I've even seen some people think that it's supposed to be doodly ding dong death clock, which is also a possibility. This person claims that they have the tablature book and it says doodly ding dong tick tock and that Brendan's been writing weird lyrics like that since home movies, which is another classic show that he created, by the way. But this does make sense because, for example, the birthday song from home movies is something like birthday is a doodly do. A ding dong doodly doodly ding dong do. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bunch of nonsense like that. This person believes that the point of the line is that you could basically say whatever you want in a death growl, and it'll sound metal, and it'll also sound like that one part in the death theme that nobody really knows what it's supposed to be. Which makes sense too. This person owns season two of Metalocalypse, and whenever they turn on subtitles, the opening line for the theme is do anything for death clock. Apparently this is also the case for HBO Max. Well, according to azlyrics.com, the lyrics are doodly ding dong TikTok five times, then Death Clock four times, then We'll Teach You Who Rock, Death Clock two more times, then it's Squizgar, Squizgelf, Taller Than a Tree, Toki Wartooth, Not a Bumblebee, William Murderface, 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 Pickles the Drummer, Doodly Doo, Ding Dong, Doodly Doodly Doo, and then Nathan Explosion. I think I'm having a stroke. Also, if you just listen to the original prototype version of the death theme, the lyrics are Doodly Ding Dong TikTok. So which team are you guys on? 
team doodly ding dong TikTok or do anything for death clock or are you team doodly ding dong death clock? Ah, I'm gonna have a stroke. Nicki Minaj Metalocalypse Drama. I actually learned about this from Minty Shit. I mentioned her previously in another entry, and I thought this information was pretty interesting, so I'm including it here for you guys. But apparently back in 2014, Nicki Minaj put out a lyric video for her song only, and it was heavily criticized to bejesus and back for using Nazi-like imagery. Nicki then went on to Twitter, the greatest social media platform on the face of the planet, I'm totally not joking or anything, and stated that the artist who created the lyric video was influenced by Metalocalypse and Sin City. The piece of Metalocalypse media that really inspired the lyric video for Only was Death Clock's music video for The Gears. And obviously that didn't fly super well with a lot of Metalocalypse fans. So a day later, Brendan Small responded to Nikki on Twitter with, Dear Nikki, if you want help with your videos, all you have to do is ask and get a bigger budget. Brendan then went on to talk about the situation with Metal Insider. They seem to be confused about art, Small told Metal Insider. Our video was influenced by Russian war propaganda art, very stylized World War II satire urging people to enlist in the Death Clock Army. The story itself is about a man enlisting and giving his life to become a clocketeer, which is a glorified roadie. When we play it live, people are pretty transfixed. I wanted to make a video that convinced regular people to join the army, granted one that doesn't exist, and who knows, maybe they would. Minaj dressed people up like Nazis and held them captive by slowly speaking to them. Which to me is also funny. Watching her video, I'm confused by how she's influenced by us. And ultimately, I don't care because I really don't think she's a Nazi. But that would be a funny reveal this point in her career. If you want my honest opinion, I don't think Nicki Minaj is a Nazi either. But I do think whoever animated her lyric video for Only probably should get a mental evaluation. Death Clock Gibson and Epiphone Guitars so Gibson released a Death Clock Thunder Horse Explorer guitar back in 2011, and that guitar later became Squizgar's main guitar on Metalocalypse. Then in May of 2012, Brendan Small revealed a prototype for the new Brendan Small Snow Falcon Flying 5, or V guitar, which now serves as Toki's primary guitar on Metalocalypse. And that guitar was officially released by Gibson in 2013. Now according to the Metalocalypse wiki, Gibson is allegedly in the middle of working on a Death Clock Snow Horse Explorer, which was shown off at Festival Supreme by Brendan himself in 2014. However, I have not found any updates regarding that guitar. Then Epiphone released their version of the Snow Falcon in 2016. And last year, Epiphone released the Brendan Small Ghost Horse Explorer, which was first teased way back in 2019. These guitars, however, are very, very, very expensive. You're going to need a lot of mucho dinero to grab one of these suckers. Trust me, if I had the assets, I'd buy like 10 of them, because they are really cool. Death Clock Figurines Back in 2008, Shocker Toys released a very limited exclusive brutal, heavy Metalocalypse figurine set containing Nathan, Toki, Pickles, Squizgar, and Murderface. The collectible figures first made their debut at the 2008 Comic-Con in San Diego. Only 500 pieces were ever made, and they went for like 80 bucks at the time. However, if you want these figurines today, get your checkbook out now. You're going to be spending a lot of money today. You better start selling your crypto investments. Not that those are even worth anything now. I've seen these figurines on eBay for like over $1,000. They're quite rare in today's climate. So if you're one of the 500 people who have these figurines, you've earned my respect. Not that you need respect from a dumbass like me. I'm just saying, I think it's really cool that you have those and don't ever sell them. Talica Parking Lot Death Clock Cameo Metallica Parking Lot is an animated short created by Metallica bassist Robert Trujillo and Titmouse Animation Studio. It was a part of the official selection at 2014's NSE International Animation Film Festival in France for the best TV film in competition. If you didn't guess by the title of this entry, this short film was centered around the parking lot of a Metallica show and features a lot of familiar faces including the cast of South Park, Thieves and Butthead, and of course Death Clock as well. It's a very neat little short that I highly recommend checking out when you get the chance. Lots of little easter eggs hidden throughout the video that you might enjoy. It's also just a phenomenal work of art, and seeing Death Clock make a cameo in this film is absolutely fantastic. The Sopranos Metalocalypse Feature You guys ever watch The Sopranos? It's one of the best television series in the history of television, my friends, and I'm genuinely not talking out of my ass right now. It's actually a fantastic show. If you've seen it, then awesome. 
If not, then I'm probably gonna call your mother up after I'm done recording this segment. In the season 6 episode, The Blue Comet, you could see AJ in the psychiatric care facility watching the Metalocalypse episode, The Curse of Death Clock. It's only a few seconds, but it's a great few seconds. There was also a previous episode where AJ is seen watching Aqua Teen, which is also really neat. I don't know, it's little crossovers like that that make me very happy. Florida and Australia in chaos. After the events of DefGov and Nathan leaving the state of Florida, well, the entire state was left in a disastrous position full of crime and blood, which kinda sounds pretty metal, I'm not gonna lie. And Scrambles the Death Dealer didn't really help either. Honestly, I think the United States just kinda dropped Florida from the country as it was just unrecoverable, which I totally think they should do in real life, but that's besides the point. The economy tanked, people died, except for the ones who either got away in time or somehow survived and continue to travel a deserted wasteland of Florida for happiness and metal. But despite all of that, Nathan Explosion was still the best damn governor those people ever had. And once Seth, Pickle's brother, became the head of Death Clock Australia, the entire country just fell apart because Seth basically diverted the entire police force to protect him from any assassination attempts by the Revengeancers. So Australia just became a clone of Florida, which is kinda gross. You know, the crime rate went up, buildings burned to the ground. Australia essentially just became that mission in Black Ops 2, where you're driving through Los Angeles and all the buildings are coming down. That's basically what Australia turned into. Basically, these two places Places in the Metalocalypse universe have descended into violent anarchy. Darksiders 2 Death Meets Death Clock Back in 2012, Darksiders 2 released to the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, Wii U, and PC. If you haven't played the game, it's alright. One of the many ways THQ promoted this title was with the help of Death Clock. So at some point during the promotional period of Darksiders 2, Adult Swim released an ad featuring Death Clock playing the brand new Darksiders title. Nathan is convinced by Murderface to hand him the controller so that he could put in a cheat code to summon death from the game into their reality. And to no one's surprise, it works! And death from Darksiders is in Mordhouse, and ends up granting the band a wish. It's such a funny and unique collaboration. If you want to check it out, just search up Darksiders Metalocalypse and it should be the first result. Nathan Explosion reads Shakespeare. So believe it or not, at two points in history, Brendan Small locked himself in a recording booth and just started reading Shakespeare in Nathan Explosion's voice, and both sessions became animated and were featured as bonus content on Metalocalypse DVDs. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Nathan Explosion reads Shakespeare 1 and 2. The first session is 40 minutes long, and the second session is like 90 minutes, I think. And it's hilarious. It's it's so funny. Like, there's even a point in part one where around the 37-minute mark, someone is trying to get into the recording booth to, I guess, kick Brendan out. But he just threatens to kick the guy's ass if he steps inside the booth, which is just so funny to me. Like, he breaks character, but doesn't at the same time. I ended up listening to the entirety of these two sessions in the car for the last week, and it's been a fantastic journey, let me tell you. I even played some of it in my car when I took my mom to get her groceries. Let me tell you something, she found a lot of it to be hilarious. Don't worry though, she disowned me afterwards. I don't know, if you want to hear Nathan Explosion read Shakespeare, which I hope all of you do, both sessions are on YouTube, so just search them up and you'll find them. Galacticon 2 is the ending to Metalocalypse. Alright, so Brendan Small has another music project outside of Death Clock called Galacticon. Now, Galacticon released two albums. Number one is not canon to the Metalocalypse storyline. Album one, to keep it brief, is about a superhero named Triton who has gone through a very troubling public intergalactic divorce. So he takes a drive through space to cool down, goes to see a therapist, finds out that his ex is possibly in danger, so he tries to save her, destroys a bunch of space pirates. It's a, it's a solid piece of work. If you love concept albums, then you might enjoy Galacticon 1. But in terms of the story for Galacticon 2, the album is completely up for interpretation. Brendan even stated that the album is up for interpretation. And then he also followed that up with, it's a story about an interplanetary war between good guys and very bad guys, and it's up to the listeners to decipher the story and come to a conclusion on whether Galacticon 2 
is a separate story for Metal Acolypse, if it ties in with Galacticon 1, or if the album was meant to be the end. And according to the wiki page for Become the Storm, Brendan also states that the album story is more of a Frank Herbert intergalactic war story with a splash of Flash Gordon high stakes drama, a planet divided, coming together to defeat something bigger. Can music bring an embattled planet together? Or are people really attracted to the calm lore of evil? And then he mentions that in retrospect, this could also fit the Lovecraft world. There is dread, there is manipulation of senses, etc. Do you guys notice how the story in Galacticon 1 is more in the listeners' faces rather than being super vague like in Become the Storm? Because again, Brendan stated that the sequel record is completely up for interpretation. Well, Galacticon 2 is heavily speculated by fans to be the unofficial, in multiple quotes, ending to Metalocalypse. Now, prior to Adult Swim announcing the brand new Metalocalypse movie coming next year, I 110% believed with all of my heart and soul that Galacticon 2 was canon in the Metalocalypse storyline, and I'll explain my views in a second. However, my opinion has since changed. Because we're getting a new movie, that ultimately means that Brendan is working on brand new Death Clock music. So here's my point. If Galacticon 2 really was the ending to Metalocalypse, I think it's about to be completely retconned. But let's pretend for a second that the brand new Metalocalypse movie is not happening. There's no new music coming out. There's no movie coming out. Galacticon 2 just released. We're still living in a shitty timeline. What exactly makes the record story even remotely canon to the Metalocalypse story? Not just by me, but by hundreds of other fans as well. Why are we so sure that it's not a continuation of Galacticon 1's story, or a completely separate thing in its entirety? There are so many different interpretations from fans online regarding this record, and I want to share some of those interpretations with you guys, so feel free to pause the video if you want to check out some of these explanations. So in terms of my perspective regarding Become the Storm, it's pretty simple. I think it follows Death Clock right after the events of the Doomstar Requiem. I believe the album tells the story of Death Clock raising an army to destroy Celestia Salacia and save the planet, and I also believe it dives into the origins of Salacia himself, like his motives for example. I believe Become the Storm is the final song that had been teased to us way back when Death Clock were told that they had to make one more song as a band, just like the prophecy stated. And I believe that Nathan is using Become the Storm as a way to unite everyone on Earth to band together and prepare to fight a war. There's also a lot of key words that are mentioned throughout the record, like Falcon, Ocean, Clock, The Star, Pentagram, that could possibly correspond to moments in Metalocalypse like Falconback or the Doomstar, etc. When I listen to the song Nightmare on Galacticon 2, it sounds to me like it's from Selassie's perspective. And what I believe gives that away is the lyric, I am half of what I used to be. Selassie is the half-man after all. And maybe Ocean Galactic is about Nathan having a conversation with his whale spirit guide. To kill a god, maybe that's the song that plays during the battle with Selassie? and where he ultimately meets his demise. The only thing that sounds odd is the fact that Death Clock have to go to space. I mean, Brendan did say it was an interplanetary war between good and evil, unless that was just a cover-up, but who really knows, right? Now because this is a Galacticon record, I think Triton from the first record does play a role in the second album, but I think his role is very small and minuscule. I think he's just chilling in space and he's not really doing anything. I think he's kind of like minding his own business watching this all go down. I mean, the guy just went through a divorce. Why would he even bother? It's not his problem. I know, pretty shitty explanation. Again, this is just my interpretation. It's not super crazy or in depth. It's pretty simple. Some of you might like it. Some of you might not. And that's totally okay. Again, my belief now is that Galacticon 2's story, if it even related to Metalocalypse in the first place, is going to be completely retconned by the new official Death Clock music we are going to get next year when the movie launches. So maybe we should all just consider Galacticon 2 as a completely separate story going forward. Despite the record being up for interpretation, I don't believe my view is perfect by any means. If you have listened to Galacticon 2 before, and you have an opinion or a theory on how it fits or doesn't fit into Metalocalypse, drop your comments below. Let's have a discussion. Just be respectful of everyone's opinions, that's all I ask. If you haven't listened to Galacticon 2 Become the Storm, and you want to listen to it, listen to the record in the order of the vinyl. The CD track order is different from the vinyl order. The CD track order is just if you want 
want to listen to like a bunch of songs. If you want to listen to the story and decipher it, listen to the vinyl order. And that order is Some Days Are For Dying, Nightmare, The Ocean Galactic, The Agenda, My Name Is Murder, Exodus, Icarus 666, Become The Storm, Could This Be The End, and Rebuilding A Planet. Now besides the story, what makes this an official, unofficial, whatever, Death Clock album is the fact that Galacticon 2 was created by some of the same musicians from Death Clock, being Brendan Small, Gene Hoglan, and even Brian Beller. Gene Hoglan stated in an interview that the lyrics, the music, and everything about this record in particular is Death Clock styled. So hey, maybe Gene Hoglan confirmed it right there, that this was actually a Death Clock record and they just couldn't call it that. Alright, no more Galacticon talk, that, that was enough talking for like a day. Death Clock Fountain Adult Swim Shop .com. This entry could have honestly been higher up on the list, but I kind of wanted to put the weird stuff towards the bottom. I don't know. That's usually a struggle I have with these icebergs and creating them. It's always hard to decide whether you want to put something at the top or the bottom. Because I do think Death Clock Fountain is very well known, but at the same time it's so f***ing weird that I kind of want to put it at the bottom. But anyways, in 2010, the Adult Swim shop offered a Metalocalypse Fountain based on the one owned by Death Clock. Yes, this was a real product that Adult Swim sold on their merch website. They also sold a Meatwad Hot Air Balloon. Both of those products were custom made upon purchase and came with some very hefty price tags. The Metalocalypse Fountain, for example, costed $40,000. However, there are no photos of the completed fountain. And to my knowledge, nobody has ever purchased this fountain or even the Meatwad Hot Air Balloon. There was even a bumper promoting the Blood Fountain, which although it says $25,000 in the bump, I remember the fountain costing $40,000 because I would religiously browse the Adult Swim shop site when I was a kid. I mean, I also used to play the Flash games on adultswim.com. I basically lived on that site for a few years, but that's besides the point. My guess is that they made a massive price hike because it would have been very expensive to craft and ship the fountain itself. I don't know, maybe fountains are just expensive to make or something. Although Adult Swim Shop no longer exists, we do have the description of the Death Clock Fountain as if it were still on the website. So in the product description, it says, Order a replica of Death Clock's fountain. Marble fountain, approximately 66 inches in height, 96 inches base in diameter. 8 to 12 weeks production time. Ships anywhere in North America or the Caribbean. Price does not include shipping, will vary by location. $13,000 security deposit required upon purchase to weed out the jokers. Fountain is not refundable. Seriously, this is real. If you want this death clock fountain, you're shit out of luck, buddy. Because it's virtually impossible to buy the one that was being sold on Adult Swim's merch site. Unless, of course, you know some people who are very crafty and know how to put together fountains made of marble and know how to replicate fountains from images and also have a lot of blood floating around. If you can make one of these fountains, GG. Deathcast. I'm adding this entry onto the end of this layer because these people deserve some love and credit for the piece of art they've created. Deathcast is a podcast starring Clocketeers 616 and 47 as they remember what those brutal years leading up to the Great Metalocalypse were like. It's basically a podcast set in the Metalocalypse universe. It's not official like Brendan Smaller Adult Swim did put this together or anything. It was actually created by a group of guys called The Weekly Geekly. And so far, there are three episodes starring these Clocketeers, and they basically cover the events of seasons one through four of Metalocalypse from their perspectives. There's interviews from other staff members, special guests, Death Clock experts, fan testimonies, and it's pretty cool to see a fan-made creation focused on the Clocketeers. Like, it's just very interesting to hear their perspective of everything as opposed to us just seeing it from Death Clock's eyes. Episode 1 of the Death Cast was actually animated recently, which is pretty brutal. I don't know, like I said, it's very unique to hear an unofficial perspective of the show from the Clocketeers. I also just like the idea of the Clocketeers having their own podcast. Like, that, that's just really funny to me. And it feels like something that would actually happen in Mordhouse. So if you're ever bored and you're feeling frisky and you want a good laugh, and you're tired of getting yelled at by your wife, lock yourself in the bathroom and check out the podcast and give the guy some love, because it's really funny. But that, my friends, was the fourth layer of the iceberg. Episode 1 Storyboard Error so I'm not too sure how common this piece of information is, but I didn't know about it until the other day, and it just blew my tits away. 
In the first episode of Metal Metalocalypse, when Deathclock decide to visit the food library, yeah, I, I mean grocery store, in the scene where Toki and Squizgar are in an aisle together, in one frame, if you look at the very top right corner of the screen, you can see what I'm dubbing as the episode 1 storyboard error. A piece of the Metal Metalocalypse storyboard was accidentally caught in this scene. It's a rough sketch of Squizgar looking down at Toki's shopping cart. Again, I don't know if this is really common knowledge or not. I've never really seen anyone online talk about about this error before. I'm guessing some people know and some don't. So hey, if you never knew about this error, then congratulations my friend. Make sure to tell your mom about this fact, and also tell her to call me up. The Often in Salacia Season 3 Finale Theory So this scene in the Season 3 Finale of Metalocalypse is responsible for creating two theories amongst the Metalocalypse community. Now theory number one is that Salacia is future Charles Oftenson, and theory number two is that Charles is Mr. Salacia's kid. Before we start, credit to SocialBunny198 on the Metalocalypse subreddit for putting this information together on a few different slides. The analysis is fantastic and it definitely gets me excited for the upcoming movie to see if any of these ideas come to fruition. So in terms of often and Salacia actually being the same person, they are not, because we have apparently already seen a younger Salacia. Do you guys remember the stranger from the Depths of Humanity scene in the Doomstar Requiem? The man who spoke to Murderface? He does look awfully similar to Salacia. I mean, the hairline, the chin beard, and even the red gem in the stranger's eyebrow piercing very much resembles the red gem on Salacia's ring. The facial structures do match up as well. Now I do want to take a moment to elaborate on the stranger in the Doomstar Requiem because I know there's going to be some people who are curious as to how this man could possibly possibly even be Salacia, and the theory or explanation that fans have created is that Salacia can shapeshift, which I also do believe. I mean, we've seen his regular form and his true form in the episode Breakup Clock, so it's very possible that he has the ability to shapeshift, but I guess we'll have all of the answers in the final movie, right? Maybe Salacia is the stranger, or maybe the stranger is just a random one-off character that really doesn't serve a purpose to the story. Besides infecting Murderface, of course. But I guess we'll have all of the answers when the movie comes out, so until then, we can only speculate. Now, when you manually de-age Mr. Salacia to his prime self, his design is not a carbon copy of Oftenson. Plus, they both have separate eye colors. So, unless Charles is wearing colored contacts, I believe this is enough proof that Salacia and Charles are two different beings, and are not the same. So that brings us to the second theory. Mr. Salacia is the father or is related to Charles. And if you do take a look at both characters side by side, there is a resemblance of sorts, like the hairline, the ear shape, the forehead, etc. They also seem to enjoy the same style of clothing. They both sit on their thrones, commanding their men. And after spending some time with the Church of the Black Clock, Charles also begins to speak more cryptically, similar to Salacia's way of talking. Social Bunny then goes on to say that one of the throwaway lines in the series might have actually meant something more. We notice Charles in the Season 3 episode Father Clock recounting a bittersweet memory of a lost father he barely remembers, apart from the fact that he allegedly had strong hands. Salacia might have had strong strong hands. I mean, he's a very powerful being after all. So from the way this is worded, it kind of sounds like either Charles' father left him when he was either too young to remember, or Charles may have had most of the memories of growing up with his father suppressed, similar to how Salacia wiped General Crozer's memories the night he massacred Cardinal Ravenwood and the soldiers. Now, Salacia and Charles did meet in the episode Death Release. Through Charles' eyes, meeting the half-man's gaze must have been the equivalent of being gassed by the Scarecrow, though the reality of what he was witnessing was actually this. Let me elaborate on Scarecrow because I feel like some of you might not know what Social Bunny is talking about in this case. Scarecrow is a Batman villain who has a signature weapon known as Fear Toxin or Fear Gas. And when people are exposed to the Fear Gas, it makes people see crazy shit, drives them insane, their biggest fears are induced. And I think what Social Bunny is trying to get at with the Scarecrow analogy is that even though Charles believed he saw this, he was actually looking at this. And through those visions, we see what appears to be Charles' previously dormant powers awakening upon his resurrection. So if Oftenson is the son of Salacia, that would make him around three-fourths human. That means one-fourth of him isn't human, which would explain his alleged powers. There's a moment where Orlog sounds sure that there's no way Charles knows Salacia's true identity before making one of his quips to Crozer about how no one goes hunting for a dead man before Salacia and all of them remember the very name of a key figure in the prophecy, and that notion doesn't sit super well at Salacia. In conclusion, Social Bunny believes that Salacia is an immortal demon that has been around since the Sumerian times, who has already been told too late of his role as the villain of the prophecy. 
The half-man must be slain by Deathclock in the final battle or he'll continue to live for all of eternity in an undying body. Registering the sheer injustice of this, Silesius opted to do everything in his power to stray from this fate and will have his offspring join him in this crusade to destroy the prophets who denied him of a regular life. But will Charles join him? I mean, after all, one cannot serve two masters. Loyalty to his father or to his newfound family, Deathclock. Charles has always prioritized the band over everything else. He took an oath. He swore to protect Deathclock at all costs. Best case scenario is perhaps Silesia eventually having a revelation similar to Anakin Skywalker, but in the meantime, Charles will, however, regretfully keep working to stop the Half-Man and continue on with his role in shepherding the Chosen Ones onto humanity's salvation, because they're his boys at the end of the day and will forever vow to die for Death Clock no matter what. Jesus, Henry Hoover Christ. I mean, I, I think I pretty much agree with the majority of this explanation created by Social Bunny, but I am curious to hear what you guys have to say about it in the comments below. Any other ideas? Are there some flaws with this? At least to me, this makes a ton of sense, and the analysis is fantastic, but it's always nice to hear other people's ideas, theories, speculations, etc. So drop them in the comments below. Other random Silesia theories. So while doing a ton of research for this video and also rewatching the show, I noticed a never ending abundance of Silesia theories created by fans online and I wanted to include them because, well, I think it would be fun to just get our brains flowing. You don't have to like or agree with these theories that I'm about to list. I mean, trust me, I hate half of them. I don't agree with half of them. Some of them are interesting, some of them are nice, but ultimately you should just believe whatever the hell you want. I'm gonna keep these brief because there's a lot of them. So there are some theories about Mr. Silesia being the father of Nathan, which isn't true because in the episode Father Clock, as it turns out, not everyone in the band has a dad, except for Nathan, and we get to see him and his father hanging out. So that kind of rules out the Nathan idea. I also saw a theory which claims that Silesia is the father of all of Death Clock, which I also don't believe. There's a theory which suggests that Silesia was another former member of the band that wants to get revenge, which I also just have a hard time believing. I mean, Silesia is an old guy, while everyone else in Death Clock are still decently young. But then again, if Silesia can shapeshift and he's an immortal demon, then does it really matter? Yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter at that point. I did also see a theory where Mr. Silesia is just Nathan from the future, which I don't know about that one, Chief. Apparently Mr. Silesia is the masked metal assassin from the future, and he wants the metal eclipse to happen. I, I saw a theory where someone claimed that Magnus was Silesia, which obviously is not true at all. There's a theory about Silesia being Squizgar's actual father, and the reason for that is because in the episode Father Clock, they never checked Silesia or any of the tribunal members because they never signed up to participate in being tested to see if one of them is the father. At least that's what this Reddit discussion was all about. It's so interesting to see other people's perspectives. This deleted user thinks that Silesia is going to play Squizgar as a trap card against Death Clock, and that he will ultimately be the traitor and not Murderface. There's a theory where water is the way to destroy Silesia, which I'm personally a big fan of. I mean, number one, because water is life, I drink it every day, but also because water in the ocean seems to be a reoccurring theme with Metalocalypse. Like Death Clock go underwater to record music sometimes. A whale speaks to Nathan. Silesia did not go after Death Clock when they escaped in the submarine. So maybe water is the key to stopping him. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you can believe in any of these ideas. I'm not your dad. I'm not your dom mommy. I'm not your kinky grandmother. I like some ideas. I don't like others. The curse of death clock isn't real. So the curse of death clock is a phenomenon which directly injures, mutilates, or kills various people who associate themselves with death clock. The main groups of people that are directly affected by this curse are death clock fans and the clocketeers. Throughout the show we see various characters either mutilated or murdered just for being connected to death clock in some way shape or form. So I was sitting on the toilet the other day and this idea just randomly popped in my head. What if the curse of death clock wasn't a real phenomenon and every single terror terrible tragedy or death in Metalocalypse was just a complete accident. Like the redneck who drove his truck into Nathan's elementary school. Maybe it was just a terrible Tuesday. Or when Murderface's father murdered his wife with a chainsaw. Maybe it was just a manic Monday. Or when Jonathan Twinkle Tits had his arms ripped off by wolves. Okay, yeah, this, this theory kind of sucks, but... I mean, hey, hey, listen, listen. I like brainstorming. It's fun. The Aftermath of Seething Vortex so Seething Vortex was the album that Nathan destroyed in Season 4. The tracks were essentially piracy-proof water tracks, 
and they're at the bottom of the ocean now and they can never be retrieved. So that ultimately means that the ocean is now full of death clock. And according to this theory, the planet will gradually become full of death clock as its music flows through the water cycle. Eventually, it will rain death clock long after the band is gone, possibly after they've either died or ascended to true godhood or whatever happens in the final upcoming movie. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, that's probably the most metal theory I've ever heard about the show. Like, even this person agrees. Megas XLR, Downtown, and Metalocalypse Shared Universe. So Megas XLR was a pretty short-lived animated show that was featured on Cartoon Network back in 2004. And the basic premise of the show is that in the future, Earth is fighting a war with an alien race and are essentially getting their shit pushed in. So humans stole a mecha robot from the aliens, modified it, and turned it into a war machine named Mechanized Earth Guard Attack System, or Megas for short. In Megas XLR, there is a character by the name Goat that owns and operates the Jersey City junkyard where Coop discovers the Megas robot. The Goat is voiced by Scott Goat Reinecker. Now I have never seen the show Downtown before, but from my understanding, it was an American animated sitcom that aired on MTV back in 1999. The same year I popped out of my mother, but that's besides the point. The TV show, according to Wikipedia, followed a cast of young adults who lived in New York City and presented their everyday lives. And one of those characters was named Scott Goat, voiced by, you guessed it, Scott Goat Reinecker. This was the first introduction of Scott Goat on TV. Megas XLR came right afterwards. And Scott Goat from both TV shows look very identical. So wait a minute, did Metalocalypse feature the goat as well? Yeah, you bet your sweet tits it did. In the first episode of Metalocalypse, as the TV network is interviewing people who are in line to see Death Clock perform their coffee jingle, there he is, baby, the goat. And guess what? He is also voiced by the one, the only, Scott Goat Reinecker. Same character in all three shows, voiced by the same exact guy. So this theory suggests that Metalocalypse, Downtown, and Megas XLR take place in the same exact universe because all three shows share the same character. Scott Goat. So is it true? I mean, nobody is saying that it isn't. It's totally possible. Either that or the goat is just an interdimensional time traveler who likes to visit random timelines. Maybe he got bored after downtown, stopped filming, and bought a junkyard. Saw that Death Clock were hosting a coffee jingle show, so he took a week off of work to see them perform. I mean, who really knows, right? But this little detail is just so cool. Pickle's real name is Pickle's Barrel. I saw this post on a Metalocalypse subreddit and nearly had a stroke. This is officially a new headcanon for me. So everyone in Death Clock has a last name, except for Pickles for some strange reason. We only know him as Pickles the drummer, doodly do. I'm not gonna start that shit again. But surely he has a last name, right? Well, let's take a look at his past. He was the front man of Snakes and Barrels at one point, and the band's name, Snakes and Barrels, is a very obvious parody of the real life band Guns N' Roses, correct? Which might make Pickles the Axl Rose of Snakes and Barrels. Axl Rose, Guns N' Roses, Pickles Barrel, Snakes and Barrels. It's quite possible that Pickles' last name was in front of our eyes for years and we just didn't even realize it. Pickles' last name is probably Barrel. Pickle Barrel, Axl Rose, Guns N' Roses, Snakes and Barrels. C come on, people, you don't see it? Don't you see what I see? I mean, it makes way too much fucking sense for me to not believe this. You could choose to believe it or be a complete denier. I will also accept Dylan Pickles as an answer. Maybe Pickles is his last name and Dylan is his first. Dylan is a name of Irish origin and I'm pretty sure Pickles has a lot of Irish in him. Dill Pickle? Look, I'm here all week, people. I'll, I'll accept either of these as headcanon. But that, my friends, was the fifth layer of the iceberg. Nathan Explosion is just Dwayne from home movies. According to this idea, both Dwayne and Nathan have a similar style and taste in music and both characters are played by Brendan Small. Also, Dwayne's rival Jimmy in the home movies episode Guitar Mageddon is rocking a police hat, which reminds me of the same hat Dr. Roxo wears. And I do know that Nathan isn't a big fan of Dr. Roxo, so perhaps they're the same person? I who really knows? Pro no, they're not. Let's be real, they're not. Younger Nathan was depicted in the episode Death Gov, so that kind of murders this idea in cold blood. I do, however, believe that these two characters definitely inspired Small when he was creating Metalocalypse. It's very possible that Dwayne was the origin for Nathan's creation, and the same with Jimmy being the inspiration for Dr. Roxo. Who knows though, right? 
Rick and Morty saved Metalocalypse. So I found this gem of a theory on TVTropes.org where this person claims that the only reason why the Metalocalypse movie is happening in the first place is because Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, the creators of Rick and Morty, allegedly blackmailed the Adult Swim execs. Basically, Adventure Bros and Metalocalypse, two classic Adult Swim properties, did not get the finales they deserved. Justin and Dan would deliberately fuck up each individual episode of Rick and Morty until their demands were met. Perhaps by simply making half-hour silent black screen episodes or by giving Justin Roiland complete control of production as the series writer and designer and I guess to spice the deal up they threw in Aqua Teen as well. This is obviously bullshit for a number of reasons. I mean, number one, if Justin Roiland had complete control over Rick and Morty and did everything, standards and practices would probably flag every single episode for being a complete drunk mess. Then again, a drunk mess would have probably been better than what they gave us for season four and five of Rick and Morty. Although, I ain't gonna lie fam, season six is pretty good. The Adult Swim executives would probably fire Justin if that was a plausible option that they could choose. Probably replace him with somebody else that could also do Rick and Morty impressions. Personally, I believe that once Mike Lazo finally left Adult Swim, the head honcho, you know, the big cheese of the network, the guy who canceled Aqua Teen and Metalocalypse, once he retired, someone stepped in and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what the f***? Why are these beloved TV shows not being continued? You know, let's do something about that. That's why these three movies are even happening in the first place. Although, I would love it if this blackmail theory was true because that would just be hilarious. Rick and Morty saved these classic Adult Swim shows. Yeah, I can see the headlines now. Whatever the case may be, I'm just happy that these three properties are even getting finales, although I really don't know if Plantasm is a finale to Aqua Teen considering there's been like several finales, but you know, who cares, right? Every viewing of Metalocalypse is personalized. You know, it wouldn't be an iceberg without the standard every viewing of blank is personalized. So let's just jump right into this shitty entry. Every viewing of Metalocalypse is personalized. The network caters to each individual viewer by showing them different episodes. If when Metalocalypse was still airing new episodes and you and your friend were watching in your own houses, there's a chance that you and your friend saw two different episodes of Metalocalypse, or maybe a different Metalocalypse bumper. Because again, every viewing of Metalocalypse is personalized. I hate this entry. Obviously, this entry is nonsense. I covered an entry similar to this in my Adult Swim iceberg, called a Every Viewing of Adult Swim is Personalized. It's the same concept, but obviously it isn't true. Death Clock are the Rugrats. So believe it or not, this entry was supposed to be in my Adult Swim Iceberg video, but I decided to cut it at the very last minute because, let's be real, it's kind of stupid. Not that a lot of these entries aren't stupid, but like, it just really doesn't have any substance to it. But this entry has just been popping up repeatedly in my mind since I started working on this iceberg, so I'm going to use it now and just put it in layer 6 because, uh, well, I could do whatever I want. Death Clock are the Rugrats, and what I mean by that is that the cast of Rugrats and the bandmates of Death Clock share a common trait. Both groups are just a bunch of immature children. That's really it. There, there's no substance to this. It's a very... I, I don't even know if dumb is the right word. What's a word that I've never used before? It's convoluted. I guess Nathan would be Tommy, and Piggles would be Chucky, and Angelica would be Murderface, <laughs> and Lillian and Philip would be Toki and Squizgar. I don't know, this, this, this idea just sucks. <laughs> The Vagina Throne. Look, I'm very sorry for what I'm about to talk about. Why is Celestia's throne in the shape of a vagina? I mean, look at it. It's got the 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 uh, uh, the labia ma majora's mask from Legend of Zelda. It's got the 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 menorah. Are those? I I don't know the parts of a of a that. Look, it's got everything. I guess vaginas are metal or something. Which is pretty neat. I guess these dildos are just a bunch of pussies. But that, my friends, was the final layer of the iceberg. Now I'm gonna go take a nap. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like I said earlier, feel free to comment below on some other little unknown facts that you feel should have been included in this video, and maybe I'll make a part two in the future. If you guys are new here, feel free to subscribe down below because it's free and you could always unsub in the future. I typically upload gameplay commentary videos about various topics on the internet that interest me, but I do try to put out at least one iceberg a month. So if you like iceberg videos, give my other ones a watch. And if you love commentary videos and you're feeling frisky, go check those out as well. Any support at all is greatly appreciated. But anyways, follow me on all of my social links and join my Discord server, links in the bio below. Have a great day everyone, and remember to always stay metal.